We've not done this before, guys. This is one of the neither have I. Yeah, I think it's one of the first NSPCC Google hang Hangouts. But um, what we're speaking about today is the underwear rule and uh, how to speak to your children about kind of un uncomfortable issues. And we have got a great panel of experts to um, to help advise everyone today. So um, I guess if, if we can start by um, if I can ask everyone to to introduce themselves. Um, Spencer, I see you, so I'll ask you to start. <laughs> Thanks. Um, hi, uh, my name's Spencer. Um, I'm a parent blogger, and I've been blogging for a couple of years now. Uh, I'm a, a primarily a sort of daddy blogger, but I sort of blogging about parenting from a father's perspective, but also blog about kind of life. Um, I have a bit of a fixation with cheese, but mainly I, the, the thing that I most lo love writing about is my kids more than anything else. So. Great. Fantastic. Um, Jane? Hi there. Um, I, my, my child and my, my stepchildren and my son are both grown up now, sadly. Well, it's, it's good, but I miss the little ones. Um, but I work very much around early years and, um, and particularly a focus on how children are affected by early childhood trauma. So I write, speak, and train a great deal on that. Great, great. Um, thank you. Joe. how about you? What's your background? Hi, sorry. Um, um, I'm a, a blogger, uh, like Spencer, not a daddy blogger though, um, <laughs> as hopefully you can see. Um, I write a, a blog called Slummy Single Mummy, which started out being much more parenting focused than it is now. Um, I started about four years ago when my children were a bit younger. Um, I've got two daughters who are now 11 and 18, so I have to be a little bit more careful about what I write about them now. I can't kind of rely on stories about them complaining about things. Um, so I'm really interested just from a parent's perspective in the new cam NSPCC campaign and to kind of share my experiences having gone through kind of pretty much every stage with children. Fantastic, thank you. And finally, Susan from the NSPCC. Oh, sorry, Rebecca from the NSPCC. Sorry, Rebecca. Hi. Um, so I'm a, a helpline uh, practitioner. I'm a senior supervising practitioner with the helpline. Um, I haven't been here very long, um, but prior to coming to the NSPCC, uh, my background is in youth justice. So I've worked with children and families uh, where there's quite a lot of difficulty and quite complex kind of needs and some and behaviors in the family um, I've got some background in working with young people who have um, displayed harmful sexual behavior towards other young people so um, sort of child on child um, uh, harmful sexual behavior and I'm some experience of that which I've kind of brought with me to the NSPCC Great. Well, I'm going to start with you, Rebecca. Can you tell us what this, what the und, you know, the, the pants rule is? What what is the underwear rule? Um, well, the idea behind the underwear rule was to kind of, was a sort of, I suppose, a a fairly simple approach to talking to children about quite a complex subject, really. Um, and the idea, the idea being that. Um, the area, you know, the areas of your body that are covered by your underwear are the private areas. So it's a simple way of, of, of saying that area is private and, you know, you decide who touches that. Okay. And it's the, the pants sort of acronym is an easy way to, to remember it, really. It is, it is. Um, if, if I can ask um, either mommy or daddy blocker to, to tell me how, I mean, I know that um, I've got a little 11 year old as well. Um, and. Uh, talking to about anything to do with, with pants or any you know sex or anything like that is never comfortable for parents. Can you um, I guess uh, tell me what what the what your top tips are for for being able to kind of broach the subject with, with a child? I guess what we'll do possibly start off with with younger children, so kids that perhaps have just started school, they're four or five years old. How would you broach it with them? Um, my my son is five in February. He started school in in September. My daughter's my daughter's three, so this is very much. This is obviously a conversation I'm going to have with them at some point. Yeah. So at the moment, it's you know, it's one of those things that I didn't ever really think I, I didn't really expect to ever have with my kids. Really, it's one of those things where you kind of you, you know, you've got to have it at some point, but it becomes almost a big formal 
scary thing and you kind of want to keep your children as innocent and as protected as possible but I know it's a conversation we've got to have at some point but and this is an ideal such a simple and brilliant way to have it I think because it is it, just it's just very very identifiable in terms of how you would initially approach or broach the subject what what do you think um, what would be your top tip you know we don't we don't have a big event to talk to children about crossing the road and keeping safe we don't have a big event about talking to children about stranger danger so we need to see it in the same way this is just part of your daily little back and forth and you know get comfortable with it yourself and you know the times I've built things up in my own mind to talk to my son um, actually he just wanted bite-sized bits yeah. of information it was too overwhelming especially when he was little and he would let me know that so I think it's about the adults getting comfortable and um, not building it up yourself because your child will then pick up on your stress and it will you know trigger their stress and then suddenly a whole different thing will unfold so it's a fun thing the pants thing is amazing because pants are funny you know we can talk in a funny way about pants it's just a funny word um, so keeping it on level in a way will get the message across better yeah, is the, is the um is this something which people are looking at to, to this, this, isn't, this isn't me a passing the buck or anything like this, but is this something that's going to be looked at to be spoken about in schools as well as, as, well as a, uh, on a parental level? Uh, yes, it is. Um, we do have schools, NSPCC school services, and this is one right. of the things that they, they introduce um, this subject, this idea, um, this way of thinking about things. In terms of um, how children progress in age, I think one of the things that's really fundamental when you are speaking to children is to take their, their cognitive um, and developmental stage into account. I know when I work a lot around the area of sexualization, I think the way that you're going to explain Miley Cyrus video to an 8-year-old, if they come across it, is very different to the way you're going to explain it to a 12-year-old and a 16-year-old. And I think likewise, when we're talking about you know your own space, your own you know emotional integrity, physical integrity. That that really plays into it. If I can, if I can go back to um to you, Spencer, with regards, I want to speak a little bit about sexualization now in general. So, with your with your younger kids, is this something that you're aware of? So not just in terms of what will I guess the potential dangers. Of, of coming into contact with people behaving inappropriately, but coming into contact with products that perhaps are inappropriate, advertisements, songs, is that something that you're aware of as a parent? I mean, I, I guess you, I guess it depends. I mean, certainly there are things that, that one doesn't do, like, you know, I mean, I, I, sticking on the music channel on the after, I mean, this might make me sound like a right old prude, but if it does, then so be it, you know. If I stick on the music channel, like the box or something like that in the afternoon, then it is a bit weird to see sort of a Miley Cyrus video. I mean, trying to explain that to a five-year-old, it's like trying to explain it to a forty-one-year-old. Sometimes it's just, it just, it just makes your head explode. It's just a bit, it's just a bit too much, really. But um, certainly, in terms of things like, you know, the sort of magazine front covers and stuff like that, you, then you don't see those so much anymore. It's not like they're. I think the supermarkets have done a great deal to sort of cover those up. Um, I think it's just you. I think in terms of sexualization, I, I, it's not something I've come across. I mean, it, it, you know, my my son, my son's my son's funny. He he's stop, he's got to that point where he stops sort of pointing out things anymore. So he's got past that stage where he sort of says that person's fat, which is quite embarrassing. But he used to do it, you know, and he used to say that the lady who lived opposite was a man, despite the fact that. So he stopped. He stopped pointing at, at people breastfeeding now, which used to make me a little bit embarrassed because it was right. like there's nothing wrong with that, and that's fine. So, um, but it's going to come, isn't it? It's it's you know it, it's one of these things. The avalanche is going to come, I think, and it's just how we as parents deal with them. I think I still have a problem. I certainly still have a problem with my mum, for example. If I sit and watch TV with my mum, yeah, and there's an episode and there's a sex scene or something, I'll be the one going bright red. Yeah, yeah. So. Jane, can I ask you as well, and it's really some interesting points, what, what's view, your view on the area of sexualization, how that affects the children that you work with? Um, well, my view, I actually wrote a, a blog for, um, there's an amazing campaign, 
campaign that's been running um, called Child Eyes UK. They're on Twitter, but they also have a campaign running um, because actually what they've been saying and is certainly what I see is that supermarkets do not do a good job of covering up um, what they refer to and are, are commonly known as rape magazines. Mm -hmm. um, and they constantly and have people send them pictures of how, you know, in, in the leading supermarkets, let alone the small shops, the magazines with the most horrendous um, headlines on are right next to the children's Peppa Pig and Spider-Man comics. And, um, I mean, you know, the headlines talk about the most horrific violence and um, sexual abuse. And the blog that I wrote was about, you know, that supermarkets need to take responsibility for the fact that many of the children and adults who are shopping there will have experienced some form of trauma, so sexual abuse, domestic abuse, all the things that they are flashing in colourful headlines and, you know, just the, the, the simply seeing a word <laughs> can trigger somebody's trauma. Um, you know, if, if a child has um, been sexually, you know, it's, it, children are very curious about words and they see words and they want mummy or daddy or nanny or whoever to explain it to them. Um, and actually we aren't protecting children from that, which is a simple thing to do. So um, I, I think there is far too much sexualization and it's just everywhere mm -hmm. and it puts terrible pressure on parents and carers and on the children. It's still there in a lot of newspapers, isn't it? It's in newspapers yeah. like, you know, The Sun and The Star and things like that, you still see it on things like that, but it, it's, it's one of those things where you're right, you to, you, supermarkets and newsagents do need to be a little bit more responsible for showing those off, I think. They do. It's 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 terrible. Honestly, it's, I would urge everybody to look at the campaign. It's a fabulous one, and it, you know, it just sh it's just so shocking. It's just part of our everyday life, um, and that's not what, okay and very confusing. Have we become a bit desensitized to it, so we have to resensitize ourselves a little bit? So we just have to kind of, you know, is it that over the past twenty years people have just become to accept that that's what what newspapers and magazines are like, and now we've just taken the stand. I think part of it is desensitization, of course, but you know, I think the discussions are out there. It's certainly being discussed a lot more than it was. I think it's about mm -hmm. implementing what we know is the common sense reality. But guys, I want to go back to kind of really giving people some tips. You know, if your child comes to you and you suspect there is something going wrong, you suspect that, you know, and, and we know that children, oftentimes young children speak through physical symptoms, so that the sore tummy means something else or that the locking in the room means something else. How, what, what are your tips for broken that subject with them? Um, well, I was basically earlier going to just agree with everything that Jane then said about how it's not about building it up into a massive conversation. It's about talking generally, but also listening, and listening not just to what your children are saying to you, but listening to their body language and watching their behavior and just being aware of how they are acting. And I, because I think quite often it won't be a case of a child coming to you and telling you something straight away. It will be that you notice a change in their behaviour. Perhaps they are having nightmares. They're not wanting to go to bed. Their eating changes. Like lots of those kind of signs can be more telling often than a child actually coming to you with a problem. So my tip would be just to be um, always aware of your children and. Um, just to kind of know them well enough so that you notice things that are out of the ordinary and then hopefully you've got that relationship with them where you've been drip feeding those little conversations along the way that when you pick up on those signs you'll be able to start a gentle conversation. I was just going to agree with Joe. really. Um, I, in terms of that sensitivity and attunement to, to your children and what's usual for them and what's not. Um, um, I had a recent experience where uh, uh, parents had very sensitively noticed that, that a child who was staying at their house seemed a little bit out of sorts and, and, and you know, they asked the child what was wrong and actually having asked the child that then, then a very important disclosure was made and the child hadn't said that, that there was a problem to anyone but, but they were sensitive to, to what was usual for her. 
and by asking her, you know, was she okay and was there something happening, then, then something very important emerged. So absolutely, I think that sensitivity to, to the low level behaviours and, and, yeah. and subtle messages from children is very important. There should be something about normalising um, the fact that we can talk about things that are uncomfortable. You know, I think little children tend to, by virtue of the fact that they seek out approval in the way that they do, that they're, they're less inclined. In fact, we're all less inclined to, to speak about things that are difficult. So modeling appropriate behavior around talking about something that you're worried about or something that you fear and, and kind of allowing them to, to have that sense of, you know, no expectation about, you know, what they did right or wrong. Because as we all know, there's always this sense of, you know, have I done something to cause it? Have I done something um, to, to, to make this come about? So being very aware of your own reactions around perhaps less comfortable discussions and, and how you react to those mm. and I think I think the most important thing for me is that we need to um, raise children from tiny babies where we are always talking about emotions feelings checking in on how they they are feeling giving them the words to connect to the feelings in their body because you can be sure that's the thing that will keep them the safest um, you know, if we aren't, uh, you know, people are talking about being very tuned into children, but in fact, we live in a society now where less and less are we emotionally available to children. Yeah. And um, the statistics are quite shocking um, because of the, the pressure that parents are under now. And, um, you know, if we are not, like we were talking about drip feeding earlier on, but drip feeding the whole emotional context of life and giving them an understanding that actually when I get that funny feeling, you know, in my tummy, that's anxiety, that's fear, that's happiness, that's then they won't ever develop that hypersensitivity of actually this person just makes me feel uncomfortable. So I'm going to go and look for somebody else or I'm not going to go with them. And that's the most important job that we have along with giving them the information that is in this brilliant campaign. Indeed, indeed. And I think it is that deciphering what those clues mean, what, you know, what they say. But also, I think, you know, the point that several of you have mentioned earlier about making it fun as well. You know, pants yeah. is a funny word. Being able to take something that's embarrassing, uncomfortable, and make it something manageable. And I think children as well that, that are more concrete thinkers, so children under the age of 9 or 10 who don't, you know, aren't able to think abstractly in the same way that older children can, having that concrete sense of, of space, of, of closeness, is really fundamental. What what experiences do, do, do you have, either personal or through your work, any of you, that um, where you think that having, uh, I guess, the basis of this rule would have come in helpful? Oh, just trying I, to think. I, I mean, I, I, we, had, um, we had a little discussion beforehand about whether we had that sort of conversation you know it's a very similar conversation when we were growing up and I was thinking that I don't think I did I don't I think it was just one of those things where you know there's just the whole nature of, of you know being what's the word for spotting signs of abuse or spotting people that you should be aware of you know we I don't think I don't think I had that conversation with a grown-up when I was growing up is what I mean to say Yeah, and I, and I think we need to be really, really careful as well. I mean, I'm sorry to labour the point because I know I am, but um, if we give children this connection to the, the words, to the physical feelings in their body, because most people who um, sexually abuse children are people known to the children, so, um, you know, we need to give them that, that possibility within close proximity. These are people they are quite often going to come into contact with in a regular basis and children um, you know they are very perceptive we will have this kind of um, basic very reptilian part of our brain that that just triggers things um, in our whole system and if we can make the emotional connection to that then, then children can be kept safer and if they know they can go go to an adult which the pants campaign talks about really well about you know how to then act and talk about it in a way but we need to give them the words so that they can do it from tiny tiny babies up to forever that's a great point now can I go to you what are your thoughts on this 
Sorry, me, did you say? Yeah, I didn't hear you, sorry. Um, I think that the pants, the pants aspect of it is nice because it's it's just turning it into a subject that doesn't have to be scary, I think, for the parents as much as the children. I think is what Spencer was saying about being anxious about having, you know, that, that conversation. Um, if you've got the pants element to it, it although it is amusing for children, it just softens the subject a little bit. So hopefully parents and other adults will feel more comfortable talking about it, um, mm. as well as it being something that's accessible for children. Yeah, and I, th I think even with older children, and you know, you can you can carry the humour through, can't you, with much older children when they're going out the door, to, you know, to their first night. Um, well, they don't call them nightclubs anymore, but you know what I mean. Just sort of saying, oh, you know, don't forget, keep it all in you. Don't let any, you know. It's that thing where you can introduce <laughs> it in a humorous way with older children that they will roll their eyes at you, but um, they'll still get the message. Mm -hmm. yeah. But again, it's not done in a heavy way. So you have a have a like um. A reference you know a framework don't you then for the whole of their childhood which is has been a light-hearted one but has a really serious message so it, it will get through much better mm. so definitely Rebecca can I ask you have you had many calls um, around this can you give us some some anecdotes that stick out in your mind and how you handled them and how perhaps the rule can come in there um, well I mean we we do have parents who who when they when they call us if they're worried about something and and they have they have said you know I, I talk to my children about the pants and you know we talk about the underwear rule so it's it's something that that is I think fresh in parents minds um, and it's something that they're conscious of um, and I think it's a a way of parents taking responsibility um, for talking for talking to their children. So yes, it is referred to um, by our callers, and certainly I would say that if 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 parents have children who who they are worried about, and perhaps you know children have said something to them, and parents aren't quite sure whether it's okay, then the helpline um, is a place where they can seek advice about that. Um, and and also for children, if they if they are worried about anything that's happening to them, then they can contact Childline and they can have those conversations if for some reason they don't feel comfortable talking to their parents or they're worried about what mum and dad might say, then they can talk to Childline and, and you know, we can use that same simple approach with them to help them understand whether what's happening is okay or not. That's fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm aware that we don't have, we've got about five minutes left and I was wondering, and I'm going to ask you guys off the top of your heads, but what would be your, your top three tips um, in, in approaching difficult conversations with children? If I can ask, um, if I can actually, if I can start with Joe and then, and then ask uh, Jane to come in and then Spencer and then finally you, Rebecca, if that's okay. Joe? Okay, gosh, put me on the spot. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I would say one really important thing is to know your child. Um, this sounds kind of obvious and hopefully most people would, but just to know that whole thing of being aware of what's normal for them and, and so being able to pick up on those signs. Um, and also then to, when, you're knowing, when you know your child you can tailor your approach. So you might, somebody might say to you, oh well I said this to my daughter or I said that to my son and, and to keep in mind that there isn't a right or a wrong way to approach it, that it's all down to the individual child and how they like to talk about things. So that's kind of the first thing. Um, I guess the probably my number two would be to not be afraid to ask questions. I think Rebecca gave that interesting example where, you know, actually children quite often are or they're only waiting for somebody just to say, Are you okay? or is something wrong for them for it all to come out, but they need to have somebody who starts it because they don't know like what the first thing they should say is they just don't know how to how to start that conversation um, number three oh, let's go with I think generally just trying to um, to keep an open mind and to really listen to what your children are telling you so I think like Jane says we're all guilty of having all these other pressures and you know all these kind of um, time commitments and things that we can just fall into that trap of going aha uh aha -huh, uh -huh, not really listening to our children so if they're trying to tell us something just make time and actually listen to them that's it 
And yeah, I would. Um, they, they are great points. Such great points. Um, for me, the top one would be always have the conversations. You know, there are many things which um, happen to children which are terrible, which we find it really hard to discuss with them or we think maybe have happened. And um, find resources would be my second tip. You know, there's an amazing book by um, Janine, Janine Sanders called Some Secrets Should Never Be Kept, which is a lovely, well, it's not a lovely, but it's it's a beautiful book and it shows um, a story of a little knight who they go to the castle and his mum has to do the cleaning there and he stays with the king or whoever he is and he sexually abuses him. And, um, you know, used in the correct way, that's a great resource. Or find some book that just gets a conversation going, you know, that, that's so important. Um, and sometimes just saying to the child, oh, I found this book. I was thinking about that today. You may never need the book, <laughs> but it's just a way in. But, um, you know, it's so important. So always have the conversation. Look for resources. Ask your friends. People often say, oh, yeah, I saw such and such, or I heard this, or I read a blog, or um, there's loads of stuff around. Um, so don't, don't avoid it. And get support. If you are really anxious, then do something like contact the NSPCC, go to a children's centre. Um, because sometimes as parents, and I've done it myself, we get very stuck in our thinking and very overwhelmed. So go and get some support. And just talking it through with someone breaks it down for you. And then, as we said before, deliver it in bite-sized pieces. That's great. Thank you. That's really great. And Spencer? I mean, as, as I said, my kids are very young, but I mean, in terms of whenever I talk to them about anything, you know, I always show them that I listen, I always show that I'm supporting them, and I always show that I love them. So um, those are the key, three key things for me when having any conversation with my kids. But in terms of what I'm picking up and what I'm learning from other people here, this is all really, really useful. So thank you. Fantastic. Finally, Rebecca, um, I guess what's the message out there? Because I, I think as you know, parents as well, I think look look to the NSPCC because you guys have this wealth of information. Um, uh, you know, you you speak to this captive audience of children who reach out to you. Who so whether it's through their tone or through their words mm -hmm. or or even through the times and the ways that they reach out to you, you have a different insight. What would what would be the main point you want people to take away with them today? Um, I, I think what I would say is, you know, if your child comes to you um, with any kind of worry or is or is showing you that, that something is wrong, then, you know, try to be as open as you can. You know, what are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to show me? And ask those really open kind of questions so, so that they can, so that you're not, you know, leading them anywhere and, and they're just able to try and, and, and articulate to you what, what it is that's wrong. So, so keep any concerns that you have, ask questions in the most open way that you can. Um, I think it's very important if your child does tell you something difficult um, or something, you know, shocking, as hard as it may be as a parent to try and keep your shock, um, try and kind of keep it to yourself and just try and, and let them know that it's okay to tell you what they're telling you. Not that what's happened is okay, but what that them telling you is okay and that, you know, no matter what happens, um, you know, they they haven't done anything wrong. That's very important. And if what they've told you is worrying and you are concerned about it, then contact us at the helpline or, you know, if your child is worried and they want someone to talk to, contact Childline and we can let you know, you know, what to do next. You know, if something ha bad has happened, then we can help guide you on what to do next. Thank you very much, and thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, Jane, Joe, Spencer, Rebecca. I think there's been some great insights tonight, and I think ultimately the, the core message that I think I've taken away listening to everyone is talk, <laughs> and more importantly, listen, because I think that's what kids need. And, you know, don't just listen to what they say, listen to what they're not saying, listen to, you know, to, to their tone, listen to what hurts, listen to, to their behavior, and, and make space for them to be able to communicate that in a way, and I know this is hard, and speaking as a psychologist, as much as a mommy, it's, it's hard not to, you know, to, to react, but I think the point is they need to feel able to emote, and, and, and so the, the more that you can, you know, uh, give them that comfort and that space 
do that, the better. Thanks again, guys, and, and thanks, um, you know, to for the NSPCC for, for hosting this, this wonderful chat. Hopefully we'll have a, a less technologically flawed one soon in the near future. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. actually wrote a, a blog for um, there's an amazing campaign that's been running um, called Child Eyes UK they're on Twitter but they also have a campaign running um, because actually what they've been saying and is certainly what I see is that supermarkets do not do a good job of covering up um, what they refer to and are, are commonly known as rape magazines mm -hmm. um, and they constantly and have people send them pictures of how you know in in the leading supermarkets let alone the small shops the magazines with the most horrendous um, headlines on are right next to the children's Peppa Pig and Spider-Man comics and um, I mean you know the headlines talk about the most horrific violence and um, sexual abuse and the blog that I wrote was about you know that supermarkets need to take responsibility for the fact that many of the children and adults who are shopping there will have experienced some form of trauma so sexual abuse domestic abuse all the things that they are flashing in colorful headlines and you know just the the, the simply seeing a word <laughs> can trigger somebody's trauma um, you know if, if a child has um, been sexually you know it's, it, children are very curious about words and they see words and they want mummy or daddy or nanny or whoever to explain it to them um, and actually we aren't protecting children from that which is a simple thing to do so um, I, I think there is far too much sexualization and it's just everywhere mm -hmm. and it puts terrible pressure on parents and carers and on the children it's still there are a lot of newspapers isn't it it's newspapers yeah. like you know the sun and the star and things like that. you still see it on things like that but it, it's it's one of those things where you're right you need to, you, supermarkets and news agents do need to be a little bit more responsible for showing those off I think they do it's 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 terrible honestly it's I would urge everybody to look at the campaign it's a fabulous one and it you know it just sh it's just so shocking it's just part of our everyday life um, and that's not what, okay and very confusing have we become a bit desensitized to it so we have to resensitize ourselves a little bit so we just have to kind of We've not done this before, guys. This is one of the neither I think, have I. Yeah, I think it's one of the first NSPCC Google hang, uh, Hangouts. But um, what we're speaking about today is the underwear rule and uh, how to speak to your children about kind of un uncomfortable issues. And we have got a great panel of experts to um, to help advise everyone today. So um, I guess if, if we can start by um, if I can ask everyone to to introduce themselves. Um, Spencer, I see you, so I'll ask you to start. <laughs> Thanks. Um, hi, uh, my name's Spencer. Um, I'm a parent blogger, and I've been blogging for a couple of years now. Uh, I'm a, primarily a sort of daddy blogger, but I sort of blogging about parenting from a father's perspective, but also blog about kind of life. Um, I have a bit of a fixation with cheese, but mainly I, the, the thing that I most lo love writing about is my kids more than anything else. So. Great. Fantastic. Um, Jane? Hi there. Um, I, my, my child and my, my stepchildren and my son are both grown up now, sadly. Well, it's, it's good, but I miss the little ones. Um, but I work very much around early years and, um, and particularly a focus on how children are affected by early childhood trauma. So I write, speak and train a great deal on that. Great, great. Um, thank you. Joe. how about you? What's your background? Hi, sorry. Um, um, I'm a, a blogger, uh, like Spencer, not a daddy blogger though, um, <laughs> as hopefully you can see. Um, I write a, a blog called Slummy Single Mummy, which started out being much more parenting focused than it is now. Um, I started about four years ago when my children were a bit younger. Um, I've got two daughters who are now 11 and 18, so I have to be a little bit more careful about what I write about them now. I can't kind of rely on stories about them complaining about things. Um, so I'm really interested just from a parent's perspective 
in the new cam NSPCC campaign and to kind of share my experiences having gone through kind of pretty much every stage with children. Fantastic, thank you. And finally, Susan from the NSPCC. Oh, sorry, Rebecca from the NSPCC. Sorry, Rebecca. Hi. Uh, We're talking about you know your own space, your own you know emotional integrity, physical integrity. That that really plays into it. If I can, if I can go back to um to you, Spencer, with regards, I want to speak a little bit about sexualization now in general. So, with your with your younger kids, is this something that you're aware of? So not just in terms of what will I guess the potential dangers of of coming into contact with people behaving inappropriately, but coming into contact with products that perhaps are inappropriate, advertisements, songs. Is that something that you're aware of as a parent? I mean, I, I guess you. I guess it depends. I mean, certainly there are things that that one doesn't do. Like, you know, I mean, I, I it, it, sticking on the music channel on the after. I mean, this might make me sound like a right old prude, but if it does, then so be it. You know, if I stick on the music channel like the box or something like that in the afternoon, then it is a bit weird to see sort of a Miley Cyrus video. I mean, trying to explain that to a five-year-old, it's like trying to explain to a forty-one-year-old. Sometimes it's just it just it just makes your head explode. It's just a bit. It's just a bit too much, really. But um, certainly, in terms of things like, you know, the sort of magazine front covers and stuff like that, you, then you don't see those so much anymore. It's not like they're. I think the supermarkets have done a great deal to sort of cover those up. Um, I think it's just you. In terms of sexualization, I, I, it's not something I've come across. I mean, it. it you know, my my son. My son's my son's funny. He he's stop, he's got to that point where he stops sort of pointing out things anymore. So he's got past that stage where he sort of says that person's fat, which is quite embarrassing. But he yeah. used to do it, you know. And he used to say that the lady who lived opposite was a man, despite the fact that. So he stopped he stopped pointing at, at people breastfeeding now, which used to make me a little bit embarrassed because it was right. like there's nothing wrong with that and that's fine. So, um, but it's gonna come, isn't it? It's it's you know. It, it's one of these things, the avalanche is going to come, I think, and it's just how we as parents deal with them. I think I still have a problem, I certainly still have a problem with my mum, for example. If I sit and watch TV with my mum, yeah. and there's an episode, and there's a sex scene or something, I'll be the one going bright red. Yeah, yeah. So, Jane, it's, can it's, I ask you as well, and it's raising some interesting points, what, what's view, your view on the area of sexualization, how that affects the children that you work with? Um, well, my view, I am, so I'm a, a helpline uh, practitioner, I'm a senior supervising practitioner with the helpline. Um, I haven't been here very long, um, but prior to coming to the NSPCC, uh, my background is in youth justice, so I've worked with children and families uh, where there's quite a lot of difficulty and quite complex kind of needs and some, and behaviours in the family. Um, I've got some background in working with young people who have um, displayed harmful sexual behaviour towards other young people, so um, sort of child on child um, uh, harmful sexual behaviour and uh, some experience of that which I've kind of brought with me to the NSPCC. Great. Great. Well, I'm going to start with you, Rebecca. Can you tell us what this, what the, and, you know, the, the pants rule is? What, what is the underwear rule? Um, well, the idea behind the underwear rule was to kind of, was a sort of, I suppose, a, a fairly simple approach to talking to children about quite a complex subject, really. Um, and the idea, the idea being that um, the area, you know, the areas of your body that are covered by your underwear are the private areas. So it's a simple way of, of, of saying that area is private and, you know, you decide who touches that. Okay. And it's the, the PANTS sort of acronym is an easy way to, to remember it, really. It, it is, it is. Um, if, if I can ask um, either mommy or daddy blocker to, to tell me how, I mean, I know that um, I've got a little 11-year-old as well. Um, and uh, talking to about anything to do with, with pants or any you know sex or anything like that is never comfortable for parents. Can you, um, I guess, uh, tell me what what the what your top tips are for for being able to kind of broach the subject with, with a child? I guess what we'll do possibly start off with with younger children, so kids that perhaps have just started school, they're four or five years old. How would you broach it with them? Um, my my son is five in February. He started school in in September. My daughter's my daughter's three, so this is very much 
there's obviously a conversation I'm going to have with them at some point. Yeah. So at the moment, it's you know, it's one of those things that I didn't ever really think I, I didn't really expect to ever have with my kids. Really, it's one of those things where you kind of you, you know, you've got to have it at some point, but it becomes almost a big formal, scary thing, and you kind of want to keep your children as innocent and as protected as possible. But I know it's a conversation we've got to have at some point. But and this is an ideal, such a simple and brilliant way to have it. I think because it, it it's just it's just very very identifiable. In terms of how you would initially approach or broach the subject, what what do you think? Um, what would be your top tip? You know, we don't we don't have a big event to talk to children about crossing the road and keeping safe. We don't have a big event about talking to children about stranger danger. So we need to see it in the same way. This is just part of your daily little back and forth, and you know, get comfortable with it yourself and. You know, the times I've built things up in my own mind to talk to my son, um, actually, he just wanted bite-sized bits yeah. of information. It was too overwhelming, especially when he was little, and he would let me know that. So I think it's about the adults getting comfortable and um, not building it up yourself because your child will then pick up on your stress and it will you know, trigger their stress and then suddenly a whole different thing will unfold. So it's a fun thing. The pants thing is amazing because pants are funny. You know, we can talk in a funny way about pants. It's just a funny word. Um, yeah. So keeping it on level in a way will get the message across better. Yeah, it's the, it's the, um, is this something which people are looking at to, to this, this, isn't, this isn't me a passing the buck or anything like this, but is this something that's going to be looked at to be spoken about in schools? As well as as well as a, uh, on a parental level. Uh, yes, it is. Um, we do have schools, NSPCC school services, and this is one right. of the things that they they introduce um, this subject, this idea, um, this way of thinking about things. In terms of um, how children progress in age, I think one of the things that's really fundamental when you are speaking to children is to take their their cognitive um, and developmental stage into account. I know when I work a lot around the area of sexualization. I think the way that you're going to explain Miley Cyrus video to an eight-year-old, if they come across it, is very different to the way you're going to explain it to a 12-year-old and a 16-year-old. And I think likewise, when we're